So, it, really happy to have Bob Poles join us here today. I've worked with Bob for uh, probably at least 20 years now in various capacities. Um, and for the last eight years, he's been uh, helping out with CACR as a consultant, various roles, including being involved in trusted CI, some identity management work, and now most recently our, our work with PAC. Um, in the rest of his life, he's uh, the principal at Bright Light Information Security Consulting. And then before that, he was the uh, Chief Information Security Officer at the SLAC um, National Accelerator Laboratory for 15 years, if I do my math right. And so we've invited him here today to go into a little bit more depth on security controls. And so with that, um, Bob, I'll turn it over to you. And um, as we've done in previous things, I'll watch the chat, Bob, and we uh, jump in as if people ask questions. So, but please take it away. Okay. Uh, so I assume that you can see the slides now, one that says baseline controls. And so what is a control? Security controls are the safeguards or countermeasures we use to detect or, or counteract security risks. And, uh, and those risks can apply to physical property, information, computer system, or other assets. Definition from Wikipedia, of course, the source of, uh, of knowledge here. So now what is risk? Uh, if you look at the total risk, which this bar sort of represents, you can have some uh, mitigated risk, in other words, somehow that you take care of some of the risk, and but what's left over beyond the mitigated risk then is called residual risk. Now, the residual risk can be in two different parts. It can be unacceptable risk, risk that you're not willing to accept, and acceptable risk. You know, you just you're just willing to take that chance, like you know when you there's a <clears throat> if you're uh, driving a car and your brakes are bad, that may be an unacceptable risk, but then you go out and you, you can still go driving and the, you, you take some acceptable risk whenever you're, uh, whenever you're out because there's always a chance that something can go wrong. So we have those, those three uh, categories of risk. As it says, Risk acceptance is sort of the heart and soul of risk management. And so you have to accept some risk because, uh, you know, it's never going to be zero. So the idea behind cybersecurity controls is that we want to reduce the risk. If we have no controls, like is represented on the left-hand side of that, then there, the ability to innovate is really, really uh, down because you have incidents. You 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 can't really uh, you can't really innovate. If you have by reducing the risk down to almost zero by having lots of controls, which of course then increases the cost. You also uh, have too many restrictions, and so there's there's a, a lack of ability to innovate. So the idea is to find uh, an acceptable level of risk that sort of maximizes this, uh, this innovation and, and particularly in research. Um, we have this, this document that was produced uh, a few years ago by John Gilligan. He's the former CIO of the Air Force. Um, Talking about the economics of cybersecurity, this document is in the uh, is in the folder for uh, for this talk. It's it's just a few pages long. And it's really worth reading. Basically, he says that there's limited quantitative data. Most cyber attacks are unsophisticated, and that you can't have total protection. So what you should do is focus on the, the low-cost, high-impact interventions, these things that basically you can do at low cost, 
and then prioritize defenses against the, these common unsophisticated attacks. We call them sort of like, we call them gray pigeons because uh, they're just so common and you just need to take care of them. And they, they generate a lot of noise and, uh, and, and are, end up being a very big distraction. Then you utilize targeted defenses against the high, high sophistication, high criticality attacks. The high sophistication, low criticality attacks, you just you you just accept. Now this is a, a chart that sort of shows uh, shows those things, where the green area says, okay, so you have some baseline of security controls that deal with the unsophisticated attacks. The yellow area says you have this where you would have the targeted uh, controls, and the sophisticated, low-risk uh, attacks, you just have to accept those because it, it costs too much to try to protect against them. Now, we've talked some in the past, some of the previous sessions have talked about the framework pillars, so you should have some uh, familiarity with those. So the main thing we're gonna talk about today again is the controls, the procedural, technical, administrative safeguards and countermeasures on the controls. Um, the trusted, TI, trusted CI framework has uh, two musts associated with controls that organizations must adopt and utilize a baseline control set. And then they also need to select and deploy additional and alternate controls as warranted. So that sort of goes back to these two areas, the green area for the baseline controls and then the uh, targeted uh, controls for the yellow area. Um, so now selecting a baseline control set. Um, so what is a baseline control set? So it's a, this is a sort of a, a detailed description of what a baseline control set is. So it's a predetermined set of security controls used as, as a default. It doesn't determine necessarily what you have to use or that you have to use all of them, but it provides the foundation from which the organization makes control selection based upon its mission. So there are various baseline control sets you can, you can choose. We're going to go through a couple. Um, some baseline control sets, of course, may be legally imposed when you have specific kinds of uh, protected data. So, again, what we're going to be talking about is this, this green area where you want to select reasonably scoped, prioritized, and evidence-based control set. So, a couple of good control baseline control sets that, uh, that we've recommended are the CenterNet Center for Internet Security, they have uh, CIS controls version 7.1, and the Australian Signals Directorate uh, has an essential eight controls that they use. So good baseline control sets are not all equal. So the, the critical security controls from CIS you might have heard of those if you have some familiarity, familiarity with this as the SANS Top 20. But uh, the SANS Top 20 has sort of morphed into this and there's this whole separate organization, the Center for Internet Security that now, uh, that now uh, is shepherding them. So these controls are prioritized. Um, there was a recent, uh, a few years ago, a paper uh, called Back to Basics, it says focus on the first six CIS critical security controls. Uh, recently, uh, CIS in, in version 7.1 of their control set have even further prioritized uh, those controls into implementation groups one, two, and three, and saying, you know, if you're this kind of organization, then concentrate on the things in implementation group three so, or imp implementation group one and then then a larger organizations have to should should pay more attention and and, and implement more controls so they've even uh, 
gone into some granularity in terms of what you should actually sorry I made the mistake of not turning off my phone here okay so so these controls are prioritized um, they've actually talked to real people out in the field and that are practitioners in security uh, including even the NSA has been involved. They're updated almost uh, almost on an annual basis uh, in terms of getting votes from the community about which are the which are the most important things, and uh, and and improving the wording of them. They are actually in the process now of producing a set of or a version of the controls um, that are recommended for uh, cloud environments. So. These controls are tested and provable as, as that they actually do reduce uh, vulnerabilities and, and improve security. And in fact, uh, there's some evidence that the legal profession may, may, may say that this, uh, this constitutes uh, reasonable security in terms of uh, when, when companies go to trial and have to determine uh, negligence. So what are the first six controls? You have to have an inventory of uh, authorized and unauthorized devices, an inventory of authorized and unauthorized software. You do continuous vulnerability assessment and re remediation. That means figure out what's, what you've got, what needs to be updated and patch it. Okay, controlled use of administrative privileges includes things like uh, making sure that you change the admin password, the default password on uh, products and software uh, when you get them and before you uh, put them into production and, uh, and track who has uh, administrative privileges on their systems. Uh, number five is uh, secure configuration for hardware and software. Um, this includes mobile devices, laptops, workstations, servers. And then number six, you've got to uh, monitor what's going on on your systems, making sure that you do perform some sort of analysis, you collect audit logs, and then you actually look and see what is happening. So those are the, those are the first six controls. The alternative baseline control set that we mentioned the, uh, from the Australian Signals Directorate, it was actually based on uh, some attacks and breaches and a study of those uh, that happened. And the controls were selected to say, okay, if people did these things, that would have prevented most breaches. And there are only eight or potentially, it actually started out as being uh, four, and they did expand it some. So they're prioritized by how many breaches the control would have stopped, and there's clear implementation guidance on those. So, so how do we compare those essentially versus the CIS version seven? Uh, so essentially it says application whitelisting. So you actually specify which applications are allowed to run. Now this sounds fairly daunting and it can be in a, in, a, in a scientific environment where people are creating their own, uh, their own applications or, or wanting to download random stuff from all, over the, uh, from all over the internet. But if you think about, there are at least uh, some number of, of people in your organization that uh, really don't need to do that. And a lot of these people say administrative uh, people are, or, or, you know, executives or people like that, that don't need to, to be generating their own software or downloading things. You can sort of figure out what are the sets, what's the set of applications they need to use and require that only them, uh, only those applications can run on their systems. And you can be very generous about, uh, about whitelisting applications. The key thing is you don't want them to run something that comes in in a phishing email. 
that uh, presumably is not going to be authorized. And that can be a huge benefit to you in terms of uh, stopping applications, particularly for uh, targeted, uh, targeted attacks. So then, of course, there's a disable untrusted OS office macros. I think that's probably less important for science. Uh, and again, they say patch applications. Uh, we've seen that before. And uh, user application hardening, uh, having a secure configuration for, uh, for hardware and software. Uh, for more, uh, restrict admin privileges. Of course, we've seen that with the CIS controls. Uh, Multi-factor authentication is, uh, is very important and is a very big uh, uh, improvement in terms of uh, security. Having that extra factor in there can help prevent a lot of attacks, particularly from, uh, from phishing. Uh, of course, patching operating systems and the daily backup of important data, which of course with we, what we've seen with the uh, with ransomware attacks about how important the backups are in terms of being able to recover systems um, without actually paying the ransom. Okay, so how do you actually use then a baseline control set? Well, you use the cybersecurity principles in terms of selecting specific controls. Uh, I think we've gone through the principles before in terms of what, uh, uh, what those principles are and, and how important they are in terms of uh, looking at cybersecurity. In particular for the controls, we have comprehensivity which is the, that the control set is the start, not the end. Some controls will only be relevant to only certain data flows. And opportunity, what are you already doing? You know, in particular, <clears throat> projects that are uh, in a part of like a university environment or university research computing environment, uh, there already may be a lot of controls in place uh, that help you, that help create an environment in which you're operating. So you need to know what, what is already, what is already being protected. Rigor, and how do you know? How do you know what's, what's actually going on? Uh, things like if you're doing backups, have you tested those backups? Have you tested that you can actually restore data from those and that you have a procedure so that you know how to do that? and proportionality. So there are some amazing controls you might implement, but are sort of impossible effectively in terms of uh, the cost or the damage they might do to the research environment. So on the next slide, we give some examples here, uh, example here of, uh, of what it's like to, or the documentation that you might have on a particular control, for instance, the controlled use of uh, of administrative privileges is in the it's in that part on the upper left. And what you see is that uh, yeah, is it relevant? And it turns out that we have a manual spreadsheet that's based on a on a pro instead of a process. You see. Uh, I confirmed that Craig maintains that spreadsheet in Google Docs. We explored this last year, but it didn't make it in the budget. And respectfully, your loyal CISO, Bob. So you've got some sort of of of, of thing about what is this? What is the status of how this control is implemented? And then there's an assessment that says, "Oh, this is unacceptable." And uh, so the uh, a manager or an auditor has come in and said, a good automated tool would save Craig's labor, even though he's doing a great job. I'm marking this as unacceptable at this time and teeing up for the next round of budgeting. So this is a way to, to keep track of what controls you've implemented, how you've implemented them, the status, whether or not, you know, remember that risk bar, whether or not this is an acceptable risk that's, uh, that's left over or whether or not it's unacceptable. 
So then, so you, you do all this and then you give your, your people some freedom to innovate, respond to your mission, your dynamic environment, and your specials. Remember the specials that are up there. So organizations have to select and deploy additional and alternate controls as warranted for, uh, for specific things. So what are the specials? So you need to secure the scientific data and the data flows. Industrial control systems and, and SCADA systems are, uh, are particularly vulnerable a lot of times because they're purchased, they have a very long lifetime, and a lot, a lot of times they, the, their lifetime or useful lifetime in systems uh, exceeds the lifetime of the company that produced them. Uh, and so they sit there and remain unpatched because, oh, when, whenever somebody designed those things, uh, they didn't really expect them to be on the net or, or, or you know, visible on the internet. And so, uh, so there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of angst over uh, how, to control, how to control access to these systems. Um, so, and another special in then is uh, identity management for distributed science communities. We had seen lots of uh, interest now in, in uh, federated identity management where uh, you have uh, large groups, multi, multi-institutional research uh, groups where they, you know, they want to just use their, their home uh, home institutes user ID and password to authenticate, and so how do you how do you do identity management in that kind of uh, in that kind of environment? Uh, so Non-facility device access to facility networks and data. So you know people want to be able to have access to to certain things like using Edgebroom or something like that to uh, to be able to go somewhere to a different institution and have uh, and have some controls that they can access. Physical environmental security, those are, those are important in terms of, of providing, uh, providing controls. Typically, you know, you've, you've probably heard that cybersecurity involves confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, and even more so with the Internet of Things, I think it also involves safety because there are lots of as, uh, cybersecurity or, or software is starting to control devices that have impact on human beings. Then we have to worry about uh, physical security and physical safety. And then, of course, uh, secure software development, uh, making sure that people develop software in a secure fashion and take security into account when they're developing software. You have to not only make sure that the software works when it gets the input that it is expected, you have to make sure that it appropriately responds to uh, the input that it doesn't expect or that it's not designed for. So, those are the, 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 the primary things that we're talking about. There is uh, a lot of collaboration that's going on, not only in the, in the U.S., but internationally about how to, what, what is a good framework or what is a good set of rules and controls to have uh, for people. Um, the WISE, it's a recursive acronym, WISE stands for Wise Internet Security for Collaborating infa e Infrastructures. Now, you heard last week uh, from Tom Barton talking about Certify. Uh, Certify collected a bunch of, or collected, or used an early document uh, from the Wise SCI Working Group. Uh, and SCI has, has developed a set of requirements that. This is designed to promote the trust between different computing infrastructures. So an, uh, an infrastructure sort of, you know, like a, uh, a group that provides uh, various services would rate their maturity level and make ratings, make those ratings available to other collaborating infrastructures. 
about whether or not they can basically be trusted. Um, and that's sort of an approach to uh, that Certify has very, sim very similar to what you heard last week. So the areas of interest are, of course, operational security, incident response, traceability. If you have an incident, can you trace, can you trace back to whoever, uh, whoever was authenticated to use that? Uh, participant responsibilities and data protection. So those are the areas in which they have uh, have various requirements. And if they, as they rate themselves, then this is used to, to promote trust between, uh, between different organizations. So trusted CI and, and wise SCI have uh, frameworks they're developing. There is a draft statement of collaboration between uh, the two so that trusted CI and WISE share a common goal to support research to the development of appropriate cybersecurity practices balanced with the research mission, because we don't want to interfere with that. Through close collaboration, the groups will ensure that cybersecurity frameworks, templates, and policies for our international infrastructures for research will go, grow increasingly aligned and framework implementations more interoperable. So that is a draft statement. It's uh, just a few more steps before we can actually uh, actually publish it, but I think there's pretty much agreement that, uh, that the trusted CI framework and the wise SCI framework will be at least be compatible. Now you've got all these things. Hey Bob? Yes. Hey, sorry to interrupt. There's a question from a couple of slides ago that I missed because I had a window covered. Um, how is the assessment number determined and why does it get the value of unacceptable? I'm, I'm sorry, which slide is that relevant to? I think it was back when you were showing the, the spreadsheet. Oh. Is that right on, Sol? Do I have the right place here? Yeah. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, well, something that I, that I sort of skipped over here. On the next slide, it says, okay, so uh, there's a research project. And uh, so Ms. Avila is the CIO, Bob is the CISO, and Craig just has to deal with the two of them. So what, what is going on here is that uh, Bob has said, okay, this is what we do to, to implement this control. So he's the CISO, and um, the CIO has come in and said, "No, that's, this is unacceptable. We can't, uh, we can't just use a manual spreadsheet. Uh, takes up too much of uh, Craig's time, and uh, we've got to make sure to have some sort of automated system to track this." And uh, and so she has said, "Okay, we're going to uh, we're going to." put this up as a, a potential thing we need to take care of in the next round of budgeting. So it's a, so that is, does that answer the question or help at all? So the reason it was unacceptable is because the CIO said this is not this this is not the way we ought to be doing things. Even though the uh, it was being handled by in a, in a manual fashion, we need the there needed to be an automated tool. Yeah, no, I think that answers uh, the question. I was just uh, wondering if this is something that is um, standardized at all across you know different organizations or different roles. As you said, you know, the, the difference between a CISO versus somebody else. So um, who makes that decision and is this something that would be standardized? Uh, it's, not, it's not standardized. I mean, it, this, is, this is basically a way of keeping track or an example of a way of keeping track of the various controls and their level of implementation. And of course, it's always dependent upon the mission and uh, you know what you have in the way of resources and how you're going to prioritize things. 
And so it's very organizational, uh, organizationally dependent. Um, and can I have one follow-up question that's been brewing in the, in the back of my mind? So other than, I guess, impact and severity um, or incidence and frequency, right? These are the two that seem to come up in terms of properties of risk prioritization. Is there anything else that is also factored in? Uh, yeah, I mean, the probability of it happening. So it's those impact severity and the probability of it actually occurring, all of which are, are some people try to make those uh, quantitative, but they're actually usually pretty qualitative. Yeah, you just had, uh, answered my next question, so thank you. Okay. Okay, so once you have all of these things in place, you know, our, you know, the question is, are we done? So we've got this, we've got a thing that says, uh, a procedure says, make sure you keep the gate locked, right? Well, there's a small problem with that. There's no lock on the gate. And, uh, and we have a policy that says, authorize personnel only. Uh, small problem. There is a, a, a lack of a way to uh, make sure that only authorized personnel get in there. So any other questions? We've got uh, 25 minutes, 24 minutes. Uh, this is slide also in the uh, drive folder. The slides, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I missed I missed the, the few at the beginning, and I just want to go back and, and take a look uh, later today. Okay. There there are the economics of cybersecurity. Uh, those two documents are also on the drive folder. The one of the, there's one initial one. Uh, and then a sort of a, a, a follow-up document that uh, that they did sort of saying, okay, this is what you really need to do. Um, there's that there's probably no way that you can defend against, for instance, the uh, uh, state-sponsored actors in a uh, in an economical fashion. You need you need help. And, and what they said is, you, you, know, you basically implement what you can, what's reasonable, and, and also um, form a, some sort of community. You talk to the, your community about what kind of attacks they're seeing, what kind of controls they're implementing, and you know, reach, reach out to them and, and, and talk together about uh, what are the controls the, what are kinds of attacks people are seeing and, and how they're reacting to them. Um, and that really, that, that really helps a lot in terms of uh, understanding where you need to uh, put, devote your resources. So that's, the, that's in the second volume of that. So I've got both volumes there in the, uh, in the, in the folder. Another question I see in the chat room, Bob, is there a repository for risk-based incidents or case studies that are shared in the community? A repository. So uh, that's, that pretty much depends on the, on the specific community and the type of, type of attacks they're seeing. And so it's, it's very community dependent. One of the problems is uh, this level of trust that people have. Uh, there tends to be a lot of um, hesitancy to share information about the kind of attacks that you're seeing and because you don't want to make, you want to make sure that the bad guys don't, uh, don't know what you've seen, what you haven't seen and how you're reacting. Um, but I think that the value that comes out of sharing this with your peer, with your peer group, 
strongly outweighs the the you know the the dangers of uh, of attack, and also uh, some you know it's at some levels the you know executives may not want to be embarrassed about uh, uh, describing what kinds of uh, incidents they've had, something like that. Uh, usually, what happens is that there'll be some informal group of the security people that will talk to each other uh, even without the uh, without the knowledge of the uh, without the executive group so that the executives don't know that the that the information is being shared but it's uh, the security people feel that it's uh, vital enough to share this information that uh, they're willing to uh, they're willing to go talk to their peers and other other institutions to find out what to know what's going on and to know where they ought to be devoting their resources. So I'll ask the follow up there, Bob. I mean, I agree. It's specific to communities. Have do you know of anyone in the the science community that has has tried to do some sharing of repository? Uh, well, certainly in the, there's a, uh, Exceed has a, uh, has a group to, uh, that meets regularly about talking about their incidents. Uh, at various points in time, the national security labs from DOE have met and, and talked about, talked about things and uh, actually share information about uh, uh, attackers and do automatic blocking of IP addresses. Uh, Trusted CI has organized a, uh, a group of the, uh, consisting of all of the large NSF facilities where they uh, talk on a, uh, on a monthly basis and share information. So, uh, and then there are various places where you can, uh, where you can get information like the uh, the Ren Isaac and uh, and also SANS uh, has uh, has various newsletters and uh, and databases that you can uh, that you can access. Uh, there's there is a lot of information out there, and so it's it's difficult to sort through it at times. Okay. Uh, one more question here from Anshul. Uh, you mentioned qualitative versus quantitative measurements. Can you expand more on this, please? Relatedly, how are uh, tangible versus intangible risks woven into risk assessment? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, a lot of times, uh, people try to put numbers on these things and they'll want it like a scale of one to 10. And, 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 you know, like one of the, the big things is like, what is the probability of, of, uh, an event of an incident happen? And basically that's usually kind of, uh, unknowable. Um, the, uh, you know, you can sort of judge that maybe based upon what kind of attacks your peers are seeing. Um, and you might think that, you know, in a research environment or a particularly an open research environment, well, you know, I don't have anything that, that, is, that is that valuable. I mean, in fact, we've had some scientists who would say, uh, you know, I want the hackers to take my data. That's fine. I don't care. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, I know of some cases where, you know, some uh, researcher was really not too concerned about somebody stealing his data. Um, and then he went to a conference and, uh, and uh, witnessed someone who had basically taken his data, taken his research, extended a lot, and presented a paper basically using his research. Uh, and he suddenly became a believer that maybe he ought to he ought to protect the data. One of the things that we're seeing is that uh, 
that uh, the attackers find it valuable not only to find out what research you're doing and that is successful, but to find out what what was unsuccessful because that saves them a lot of uh, you know a lot of time and energy and resources going down the paths that you've already explored and find found that oh, okay that doesn't work out all right well they don't have to do that then uh, so. Uh, all of that data is valuable in a research environment. Um, so getting back to the uh, tangible versus intangible, I mean that you know the the intangibles are are you know the, that's that's one reason that that I'm saying that these are qualitative and not quantitative is that you kind of have to judge, well, you know, what is, what is the value of the reputa reputation of the institution or the reputation of the, of the researcher uh, in terms of, you know, how it's going to, how a, an attack, um, how, an, how, an, how an attack would, would have an impact on that. That's, that's an intangible and it's sort of, it's difficult, and that's one of the things that's going to be um, sort of woven in there. It's and it's based upon your, you know, how you feel about risk, how you feel about taking risk. Some people are very risk averse; uh, others are are more accepting of risk, and so that's sort of an intangible that's that or some something that you have to have to take into account and why and one of the reasons that you know risk management is is different for different organizations a lot depends upon the people involved and the kind of situation they're in if you're dealing with for instance with classified or protected data in some sense then that tends to make you very much more risk averse and so you'll weave that in in terms of how much risk you're willing to take, how much risk you're willing to accept. And that's another reason that it's always quantit or qualitative and not quantitative. Did that help at all? Or did I just ramble on? Both probably, I hope. You got a yes, absolutely, Bob. Okay. Please, Anshul, go ahead. Feel free just to do it verbally if you'd like. Um, sure, thanks. Uh, so first of all, thank you. I really appreciated that. And especially as a social scientist, um, it's always nice to see the qualitative side of things being brought to the forefront. So I really did appreciate that. Um, I guess one last question, I, and, and this is so interesting because um, in the social science side, we have a whole uh, body of literature that looks at harms and harms prioritization and things like that. And one of, so I'm trying to connect it to um, what, what I'm sort of, uh, what I've been exposed to. Uh, so a related question is, um, is there ever a, and this may be related to again, the tangible, intangible, but can you also have primary or direct, secondary or indirect and tertiary or other ripple effect types of risks? Um, which one of those, I'm assuming obviously primary and to some extent secondary is taken into consideration, but could you comment a little bit more on that? Um, well, I mean, I mean, certainly in terms of the risk calculation, if you will, or calculation or evaluation, you know, there, there are certainly primary risks in terms of the direct damage. I mean, if you have a cyber attack, or say something like uh, you know ransomware uh, attack, you know a primary primary effect is that you can't get at the data, and that you've either got to pay the ransom and you may or may not get your data back. Uh, maybe you can crack the 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 encryption that is used, or hopefully you have backups of your of your data so that you can just restore from the backup. Um, certainly, the the city of Baltimore is basically. I think there's at, after a month they're still basically handling everything by paper now manually uh, because of a ransomware attack. 
that they that has completely disabled the government of this uh, city of Baltimore. Um, so, uh, you know, that's certainly a, a, a primary effect. Uh, secondary effects are going to be, you know, what's it done to the to the reputation? What's what? what you know, are these uh, are these people going to be uh, reelected again? Or are they going to lose their jobs? Um, there's a story that they actually took out or had an opportunity to buy insurance uh, against a ransomware attack and decided it was too expensive and turned it down. Um, and of course, you know, the, one of the, one of the reasons that they, that they were so uh, vulnerable was because a lot of their systems were old, outdated and hadn't been patched. Um, which allowed the, uh, the ransom or allowed the encryption to, to really spread throughout the whole, uh, the whole government complex. So the, so there were sort of the, you know, so the, there's, there's the direct, which is that impact directly on the, on the system. I'd say a secondary effect again is the, the, you know, what's going to happen to the people who are responsible, uh, for this attack, who's going to be judged to be responsible, and what is the impact going to be on their jobs and life, and, and what is the impact going to be on uh, the people of Baltimore? Uh, how is it going to? How is the this fact that all these services are being uh, now handled by manually and by paper? Uh, what what is the what is the rolling uh, uh, impact on that? Uh, tertiary impact. I mean, hopefully, I'm not sure if this counts. Would would be sort of like, well, what are they going to do to uh, to uh, prevent this in the future? What is it going to mean uh, for the taxes in the city of Baltimore? They're going to have to have more taxes to be able to. Uh, you know, maintain their systems properly. How how is that going to impact things? So, uh, does that answer sort of answer your question in terms of what are the various kinds of impacts? Absolutely. No, that was uh, that was fantastic. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, Bob, I'll thank you very much for, for coming on and making the presentation today. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, next week, we're going to dive a little bit into some economics of cybersecurity. We've got um, Scott Russell from my team here at CACR that'll be joining us. Uh, he's going to give a presentation and some updates on a, a paper that he presented back at a summit, I think two years ago, and you can find the link in the syllabus for those of you who like to read ahead. Uh, so with that, maybe I'll toss it back to Dana. Do you wanna give us any closing words? Um, just to thank Bob and thank you, Vaughn and Diana and all the fellows for participating. Good, we'll look forward to seeing everybody next week. Yep, thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.